Well, hello again, everybody. It's uh, Philip Shields, and this is the final second part to a two-part message titled, Why Were You Specifically Chosen by God? Why were you specifically chosen? You specifically. It started out as a question that several had asked, and frankly, I'd even ask myself that often. And most of my sermons, in fact, start as a frustration I'm feeling, a question I have, a thorn I'm struggling with, and you get the point. I'm very human, struggling with lots of issues we all face, and I'm trying to find peace and answers in my great God and in, in His Word, and just basically share that with a lot of people. Several of you sent in your ideas, and I'll read a couple of them and use a sentence here and there from several of you. You know, using one person's idea is called plagiarism. Using a lot of people's ideas, though, like I've done, is called research. <laughs> so some of you sent in some thoughts on this, and thank you. So why were you called and chosen? Why you? Why me? And I don't mean the generic question and answer of why were we all called, or why does God call people, uh, which is worthy of several sermons by itself. Those broad generic answers, of course, include wonderful answers, uh, but not the answers I'm going to be getting into today. I hope you understand that, and don't feel frustrated by the fact that I'm not giving these answers. Uh, but we, the generic answers have been that, of course, we're called for God's glory and joy. We've been called for salvation. We've been called to help others in the kingdom. So we're being called now and trained now to be servant rulers, priests, and judges. We're being called and prepared to marry Christ, uh, to have a people prepared for their God, to teach the world God's ways. And, of course, we're being called to be the body of Christ and to support God's work through tithes, prayers, and our, and our own work. But I want us to focus on why you specifically were called, so please don't despair if I don't dwell on these other topics. But, uh, frankly, I personally never heard why were you specifically called as a title for a sermon before, though I'm certain someone's covered it, and probably many times I just haven't come across it, at least not one that I can remember. Excuse me here, I'm just getting set up here a little better. I certainly hope that you children, teens, young people, unbaptized brethren, are listening carefully too, because you're part of this family and calling. You kids are called holy and sanctified because of your parents, and eventually because of your own decisions, your own decisions, for or against God's way. Peter told the crowd on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2 verse 39, that his message was for them and their children. He actually says in Acts 2.39, For the promise is to you and to your children, and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Now that seems to imply to me at least that at least some, maybe most of our children and teens in the church, are being called or at least have an open door into God's presence. A contributor to this sermon from California wrote me, Quote, I'm quoting, he didn't want to wait to live with me and in me. He wanted to bless me with himself. His specific reasons may be his business. I only know that I am so happy God chose me. God also so loved the world, but because of his mercy, I'm still quoting, I didn't have to wait in darkness. So I got to come out in the light sooner. So this person, end quote, this person really appreciates being called now, and I wish we all appreciated it more. Then she adds this, specifically why you or I were chosen won't fully be known until God tells us personally. And of course, until we, end of quote, until we see the completed project of God's spiritual temple. True, but we can get some ideas that can inspire us and get us thinking on the possibilities and help us to value and appreciate the high calling that we have more. People always perform better whenever we understand why we're doing a particular thing or why we've been asked to do something. I felt the church, and I feel the church is languishing right now, frankly. There's a sense that we've lost our way. We've lost our sense of direction, our purpose, and our zeal. I see it. I'm hoping this two-part sermon helps us regain some of the zeal we may have once had, the first love, if you want to call it that. If this message helps you, then please let others know about the website and the message. I can send them even the tapes if they wish. One person in the Midwest wrote me this way. She says, I don't think anyone can even imagine what God has in store for each of us. It's going to be far greater than any of us would know here. 
So she says, uh, we're part of what God's word calls the high calling, to be part of the better resurrection. So it's well worth thinking about. At another time, I'll give a sermon on why the first resurrection is called the better resurrection, but that, again, is not the, the focus of this sermon. You've heard the analogy before. I think it's a good one. We're all like individual knots in a tapestry someone is working on, the someone being God. We see it now from the back end, and the picture is not at all clear to us. And we're just a knot in this tapestry, only when the other knots are put in. And the tapestry is turned over, and we step back a ways. Then we see what the artist had in mind. And then we will know how our lives, the one or two few knots in the tapestry, fit in. And yes, our lives can seem, from this side of things, at least pretty naughty. <laughs> a lot of knots at time. I don't mean naughty, but naughty. Sometimes it's naughty, too. <laughs> I'm going to go over some of the points from last time to partly review, but also to add some more things I didn't get to say last time or have thought of since. Last time we discussed that you were picked according to 1 Corinthians 1, 26-29 because of the very fact that you and I have so little to offer. And God did that, called you, specifically because you and I have so little to offer. Not because we have talents, not because we have things he liked in us. God called us to confound the wise, the mighty and the noble, to show what his power can do. Don't forget the scriptures where he says to Israel, don't think that I called you because you were so mighty and great. He says, you were not. I called you because you were not the great. You were slaves in Egypt, he says. So, And now remember, we're spiritual Israel. We're the Israel of God today. So that's point one, why you were chosen according to scripture. God's power, God's glory is magnified. He gets the glory when he shows what he's able to do with such weak, untalented, untrained people like most of us are. God is going to shock the world when he reveals his sons and daughters. But when he does reveal us to the world, we're going to be all polished up and perfected in Christ and ready to rule the world. Look what Jesus did with the Galilean untrained fishermen and despised tax collectors. God rocked the world with their message and their work. He isn't done rocking the world with the people he's calling. You are being called to bring God glory, to accomplish a purpose. I want to say more about this for a few minutes because some of you feel and have said that there is no way God could ever use you significantly. You feel there is no way, you say, that you could ever begin to be on the same page as the great men and women of the Bible. So let's look for a few minutes at those God has chosen in the past, people we normally think of as incredible spiritual giants. I will review these not to grave dig in their past, but to remind you and inspire you that God uses whomever he chooses, and God usually has called people with handicaps. God usually has called people with baggage. God changes people and then uses them, and he can do the same for you. Yes, you and me. God called various ones, even you, to do a task for specific reasons, and he called you for a specific reason as well. You have not been called simply for your salvation. Simply put, it's not in it just for you. Not at all. I hope this list will inspire you that it's not over till it's over. If you look at your baggage in your life and the problems you have, God works with all types. And don't limit him by doubting what God has in store for you and in mind for you or could be doing with you even now if we would simply turn our lives over to him. Be sure to print off a transcript if you want the scripture references because there's gobs of them in the transcript. that I just won't have time to refer to them all uh, on the audio uh, it'll just take too too much time and gets uh, ponderous and laborious doing it that way. Many many of these I'll turn to. Some of them I many of them I won't. But print off a transcript if you want to do a study with all the scriptures in them. I'm going to go through a list of people. People we consider great people. And what they really were like when God called them. And I think you're going to be surprised. How about Abraham or Abraham? who had to be called twice to get out of Ur and go all the way to Canaan. That's news to a lot of people. If you compare Acts 7, verses 1 to 4, compare Acts 7, 1 to 4, with Genesis 11, 
verses 31 to 32, and then keep reading into Genesis 12, verses 1 and 2. There were no chapter breaks in the past, remember. He was already an old man, and God had to call him twice, tell him twice to get going, to get moving. Don't think you're too old. Plus, this great father of the faithful was in, with an incredible faith and being willing to sacrifice his only son of his old age, had lapses of faith. He lied twice about Sarah being his sister to avoid having to admit she was his wife. He was afraid of her beauty. He let Sarah talk him into having sex with Hagar as their human solution to God's promise of a son. That was a lack of faith, if you think about it, and so on. But guess what? God's glory was declared in Abraham's weakness, and he became the father of the faithful. He wasn't always some pillar of faith. He just wasn't. And I think sometimes we tend to put these men and women who are the greats of the Bible onto a pedestal when they were very human. And I think God's real message to us is, hey, these guys are human, and I can do the same in you that I did with them. Sarah, Abraham's wife, whom we think of today primarily as a model wife, in 1 Peter 3 it talks about that. Sarah, Abraham's wife, was harsh and abusive to one of her servants. It says so in Scripture, in Genesis 16, verses 6 to 9, that she was being very harsh to her, uh, to her slave uh, Hagar. Yes, they had slaves. By the way, Moses was an exiled felon and murderer who stuttered. Have you been a jailbird? It's not too late if you believe what God can do with anyone who submits to him. Moses was hot-tempered at times. And you know, God used him mightily in spite of all that. How about King David, one of my favorites? A man after God's own heart was a brutal murderer of one of his most loyal men who would have, who would have and did give his life for his king. And he didn't just kill Uriah, but there were many others who died alongside Uriah. We forget about those. Might have been 10, 20, 30 other men. And that was after David stole this man's only wife, when David already had eight of his own. And in spite of his murder and adultery and other sins, many other sins, God used him to write many of the Psalms. You still read David's writings, including some that he wrote after the horrible major sins. God still allowed him to continue to write the Bible, continue to be prophet as well as king, not just the king, but also the spiritual side of prophet and writer of the Bible. So think about it when you feel you can't listen to someone you've heard bad things about, because if you're going to be consistent, then that would be true of King David, Samson, and so many others. Hosea had a wife, Hosea the prophet had a wife who was a prostitute. So don't ever complain about your wife. Later he had to buy an adulteress in Hosea chapter 3. Esther, on the other hand, had a husband so mean that if you approached him without his permission, he could kill you at the drop of a hat. Could kill you for it. The very next moment. So don't complain about your husband. Don't feel you can't accomplish more because you have such a bad husband. God still used Esther and Hosea in spite of the kind of spouses they had. Noah got stoned drunk after the flood. Our over, overall record, however, is that out of the whole world, only Noah found grace with God. He found grace because he was looking for grace. He needed grace. Have you had a DUI on your record? That's past. We're talking now about God's gift to you, which we'll call the present. You've ever been drunk? Hey, let's get over it. Noah did. Lot did. Samson, a judge, was a womanizer, par excellence. And in the end, God used him mightily, as he's recorded in God's Hall of Fame of chapter 11 of Hebrews. Have you been a womanizer? Repent, overcome, let God's Spirit clean you up and use you like he did Samson. Paul was mean when God called him. He probably even killed early Christians. He called himself chief sinner as well as a blasphemer, persecutor, and an insolent man. 1 Timothy 1, verses 12 to 15. Yet look how powerfully God used him. Are you far from being the nicest person around? Trust God. He can still use you. Are you just a widow? Just a widow? God also called many widows, ordinary widows, like Naomi and Ruth, the widow of Zarephath, the widow who gave the widow's might, Tamar, and so many others. Don't think you're limited because you're, quote, just a poor old widow. 
Have you lost faith? We think of Elijah as being one of the greatest men of faith because he had this great demonstration of faith. If God be God, serve him. If Baal be God, then serve him. But quit halting between two opinions. And then he has this prayer that takes seconds to say a mighty bolt of fire comes down from heaven and consumes the sacrifice as a result of, of Elijah's faith. And then he kills the priests of Baal and then he prays. He had to pray seven times, but he prays and then the, the drought ends. And then he, in faith, runs ahead of Elijah. I mean, of uh, King Ahab, I mean. I mean, a powerful, powerful display of faith that day. That's all in First Kings 18. The very next day, he's a whimpering, burned-out warrywart when a woman named Jezebel threatened to kill him. I take great comfort in that, for at times I can have great faith, and so can you, and at times my faith really wavers. So does yours. Thank you, Elijah, that you've shown us that even someone like you, the Elijah, the original Elijah, can also doubt and fear. Are you getting the picture? Why am I going over all these? So you realize you're in good company, even among the biblical greats. Yeah, we're not so great. We're not the mighty. But God is using you and will continue to use you if you submit and stop limiting what God may want to do in and through you. Here are a few more. Rahab, the innkeeper, and most agree was also a prostitute, a harlot, when God chose her to be in Jesus' own family tree. Have you... Oh, many of us had. Have you ever had an immoral sexual past? Let's get over it. God can use us, even if people want to reject us. And yes, Hebrews 11 says, Rahab the porne, Rahab the harlot, where we get the word porn or harlot from. Another woman of questionable past, the Samaritan woman at the well who'd had five husbands. John 4:39 was used powerfully to be the primary witness to the whole city about who Jesus was. And she probably set the stage, in fact, for the great chapter of Acts 8, about how many in Samaria, Samaria were converted after the day of Pentecost. Are you too short? Or worse, someone despised by many? Someone who's committed what some other self-righteously will call him, oh, he's committed major sin. Well, talk to Zac Zacchaeus or Zacchaeus. Jesus called him too. He had dinner with him. Remember the story? Look, look at it. Luke nine, Luke nine. I mean nineteen. Luke nineteen, verses one to eight. There's a big crowd, you know, coming following Jesus, and he stops, look up, looks up at Zacchaeus in the sycamore tree, and he says, "Zacchaeus, come down from the tree. I've got to have dinner with you." And for doing that, even Jesus received a lot of persecution and criticism, a lot of trouble because he wanted to specifically call someone like Zacchaeus, someone who had had a horrible reputation. Whatever your past, Jesus came to seek the lost, even you, and yes, even me. We've all, after all, earned the death penalty, and we all, after all, killed Christ by our sins. We've all done that. Are you a gossip? So was the prophetess Miriam, Moses' sister. Numbers 12 tells us about that. God considered her one of the three main leaders he used to bring Israel out of Egypt. That's in Micah 6 and verse 4. Again, all these scriptures are in my transcript. Perhaps someone hearing this has had demon problems. Is that too late now? Is that so bad that God can't use you? Well, the one person that Jesus first appeared to after his resurrection, the first witness of the risen Messiah, was a woman who once had seven demons inside of her when Jesus called her. Seven, brethren. Mary Magdalene. Could someone like that be used? You bet. And so can you if you believe in the power of God to change lives, even your life and even mine. See, I know what I am, I know what I was, and I know what I'm going to be, and I sure thank my God for that. I don't care what people say. God's changing those of us who want to be changed and know we need it. Isaiah, who is now known for his incredibly inspiring and beautiful verses, 
claimed he had a dirty mouth before God called him. Did you know that? Isaiah 6, verses 4 to 6. I'm a man of unclean lips. God still used him and turned around his filthy mouth into one of the greatest examples of prose and poetry in all the Bible. Obviously, God can override evil and make things come out for good in the end for his purposes, so don't give up. In fact, it's in the hard times when we grow the most. It's in the hard times that we grow the most. All of these men and women, just like you and I will have to come to, had to come to realize it wasn't going to be their talents. It wasn't going to be their abilities, their money, their ideas, or some good thing in their, I don't know, in their lives, in their character that God somehow needed and wanted. I don't buy that. No, brethren. That would be, that, that's not what would get the job done, but not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, by God's spirit. Zechariah 4, 6, that's what would get the job done. I think most of you know that. And now if we go to uh, 2 Corinthians, I'd like to turn you to turn there. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 8 to 10. I hope going through that list makes you really think. Makes you really think. Boy, we could have gone on and on and on. But I hope you got the point. God isn't done with you yet. You worked a long time with a lot of these men. Second Corinthians 12, verses 8 to 10. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times. He had a thorn in the flesh. He had a, a physical problem, you see. That it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient to you, for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Continuing to quote Second Corinthians 12, verses 8 to 10. Therefore, most gladly... I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And therefore I take pleasure. Boy, I'm not there yet, folks, but that's our goal. See, look at this. Uh, I take pleasure, he says, in infirmities and reproaches, in needs, in persecutions. I pray that God doesn't perse allow persecution. But, you know, look at Paul. He says, I take pleasure in these things, in distresses. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I'm strong. He's strong in the power of Christ, he said earlier at the end of verse 9. So our husband, Jesus Christ, is telling us we don't have to have a bunch of talent. In fact, we just don't have it. We don't have to have a lot of strength, energy, abilities, or come from royalty. He says, your weakness, in fact, accentuates my power. So accept your weaknesses, because when you're weak, God's strength is highlighted. What God does with me and with you it has to be seen as God doing it, or we'll get a big head and fall flat on our face. That's why I've come to believe over time that Samson probably did not look like Schwarzenegger, probably did not look like that, but appeared as any ordinary man. His strength was not in his muscles, but his strength was when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. In the transcript, I give lots of uh, uh, verses in Judges that say, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and then he got real strong, and he did this, and he did that. You can read it for yourself in Judges 14, 15, and 16. Um, the lesson is there for all of us. Now, if, if this ordinary-looking guy suddenly is just a, a titan of a power, we, uh, you, you would know that it was something un unusual. If he, if he looked like Schwarzenegger, you'd say it was his, because of his big muscles, his big muscles. Now, we need to know and trust it and be in such close contact with God every day that we can receive God's power just like Samson did and God's blessings, God's open doors, God's working in our lives. Okay, we also covered last time how, it was, how God the Father himself personally planned you and chose you, how God the Father was very involved in your life, didn't relegate it to anyone else, not even Jesus. That's, that's not answering why you, but it must be said. We have a very personal, direct relationship with God. And you know, folks, I've got to say, the fact that anyone important would ever even know I exist, let alone take note of me and say he wants me, tells me he wants to spend the rest of eternity with me, and then invites me to marry his son, who will be the king of kings, and then offers you and me everything he has, 
bestows on you and me his love and joy and peace and meekness and all the all the wonderful gifts of the spirit fruit of the spirit and he personally hand picked me and you for all of this that boggles my mind I sometimes don't even want her like myself so I ask how can such a holy perfect blameless God and father choose someone like me do you ever wonder that of all people on earth I'm the last I'm the last he should have chosen but he did he still did and he picked you too maybe you were the next to the last I don't know but then add to the fact that this holy God sent his one and only son to live a perfect life and then die for me and you so we could be washed forgiven and have everlasting life with him should sober us up real quick so regardless of what people say about you and me regardless of that it doesn't matter God lived and died for me and you though people may reject us God hasn't and ultimately the only one who matters hasn't rejected me or you I think that's awesome so no matter your past if God's calling you you have gotta feel special God the Father has turned his heart towards us he's very accessible and that's what it means now when we pray in Jesus name that we come in and we come boldly to our Heavenly Father just as boldly as Jesus himself would you know what God the Father is very involved in your life and Jesus said very clearly I want you to read it in John 16 verses 26 to 27 in a newer translation that God loves us so much that he Jesus doesn't have to petition the Father for us when we ask directly because of that great love we also showed how God plans for you I believe from long before you were even born I gave numerous scriptures in part one to show that people resist this idea and I heard some comments back on that on this one point they said I like the sermon but I don't know about this thing about God having planned us long ago after all this thing with Abraham and now I know that you fear me and obey me and so on so let's talk about that a little bit more I want to spend a little time on that there is free choice but I showed I showed last time that God is so all-knowing that he still accomplishes his purposes while allowing us what seems to be free choice and is free choice some of you commented after part one that you couldn't quite accept that that's fine but let me say a bit more so you can some, have, have some more things to think about I believe God is so wise and all-knowing that Acts 46 10 says he could declare the end not just know the end declare the end from the beginning and still allow for free choice on our part as we each practice free choice God in his wisdom and incredible smarts God still orchestrates everything to work together exactly as he had planned how else can he declare the end from the beginning now let's look at Abraham's situation a little more closely I want I want you all to think about this and if I'm wrong I'm wrong but I, I really think I'm not on this case even in Abraham's case when God said now I know you fear me and obey me now I know that's Genesis 22 12 I'm not ignoring that scripture let's look at it Genesis 22 12 after he was ready to sacrifice Isaac after he saw Abraham willing to kill his only son I think most have read too much into that one verse when we put it alongside all the other verses about God being all-knowing think about it you need to put that verse alongside the one that says God won't test us beyond that which we're able and he knows ahead of time that we can pass that test with his help or he won't present us with a test that's what it says in 1st Corinthians 10 we all know the verse right 1st Corinthians 10 13 we can fail the test and many of us do but God is so wise and all-knowing that he can still work things out for good in the end all the while giving us free choice now also the word no in the Hebrew is far more expansive now also don't forget that God had already promised Abraham so much unconditionally at this point I mean Paul makes that point very very clear in the book of Romans and many other places that uh, the promises were made to Abraham before he was circumcised and long before there was even an Isaac 
And so anyway, so the word know in the Hebrew is far more expansive word than our English word. It's a bigger word. It can also mean approve, among many other meanings. So God's also saying, now you've proven your love and obedience. Where it says, now I know. That can also be translated, now you've proven. You've, I've, I've approved you. You've proven your love and obedience. God knows what we're going to pray for before we even get on our knees. It says that in Matthew 6, 8. If God knows that much about us, wouldn't he know what Abraham would do? He knows our thoughts and the intent of our thoughts. Don't get stuck on the word now I know because it can be translated many different ways. If we read the 10 or 12 verses of Psalm 139, the first 10 or 12 verses, you'll see just we can't hide anything from God. We just can't. You might even want to stop the tape and just read Psalm 139 verses 1 to 12. It's just an amazing passage. He knows us. He made us. He fashioned us to function a certain way. There's no hiding from God. He searches our hearts. In 1 Chronicles 28.9, 1 Chronicles 28.9, just jot it down. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands all the intents of the thoughts. You can compare that with a couple others I'm going to give you here to jot down. Psalm 94.11 and Jeremiah 17.10. Psalm 94.11. And Jeremiah 17.10, where he searches our hearts. God's word discerns the thoughts and the intents of the heart, it says in Hebrews, Hebrews 4.12. Now, brethren, we can't have it both ways. I want you to think very carefully about what I'm about to say here. We can't have it both ways. We can't say God is all-knowing and then turn right around and say, but he doesn't know what we're going to do. You, we, we, we can't have it both ways. That's a contradiction. Either he's all-knowing or he isn't. And God's word seems to indicate that he is. Now, there are even some who feel, no, God isn't all-knowing. Well, I, I tend to feel he is. So we have to take Genesis 22:12 and understand that God is saying there to Abraham, now you've proven you fear and will obey me. Is God caught by surprise ever? Or caught off guard? Did God really have no idea what Abraham was likely to do or was going to do? Don't we, even mere mortals that we are, know at least 95% of the time what our own children would do in a given circumstance? I've rarely, rarely been wrong when I've had a hunch about what Rachel or Heather or Jonathan's going to do in a given circumstance, if I knew the circumstance they were in. God, who knows our thoughts, our hearts and our minds and our loves, our hurts, surely knows us very, very intimately. and I, I, I don't know the heart of my children. I know to some extent, but I can't read their mind. I can't read their thoughts. But he can. He even knows our needs before we do. And he knows what we're going to ask before we ask, Matthew 6, 8. But somehow so many conclude that he didn't somehow know that Abraham would obey this matter of offering Isaac. To me, that just doesn't square with the rest of the Bible about God being an omniscient, all-knowing God. God even says that he knows and understands our frustrations that we can't even put into words. You know the passage in Romans 8. I don't have to turn there. Romans 8, 26 to 27, about the, uh, the, the feelings, the words that we can't even utter, that the, the Spirit translates this for, for us for, to God. And then uh, we come to Psalm 139. David could say, all the days of my life, all the days allotted to me, were written in your book before I was born. But somehow God had no clue what Abraham would do? That just doesn't make sense. Let's turn to that uh, passage in Psalm 139, in fact, and let's read it. Psalm 139. Psalm 139, verses 15 and 16. Why don't you turn there real quick? To me, that just wouldn't make sense. So uh, you can believe what you want to believe, and I believe that God did know. I believe God was really saying, Abraham, you know, You've proven your love here to me, and now I know that just, boy, nothing's going to, there's just nothing you wouldn't uh, withhold from me. But it, it, I don't think God's saying, boy, I had no idea, Abraham, you've sure surprised me. I don't think God's saying that. Psalm 139, verse 15 and 16. My frame, my body, was not hidden from you when I was made in secret. Psalm 139, 15. And skillfully wrought in the lowest parts, parts of the earth, a poetic way of talking about the womb. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book they were all written, the days fashioned for me, 
when as yet there were none of them. Now you go figure that one out. Now I'll be turning to Genesis 50. I'm not saying, brethren, that we don't have to make our calling and election sure. Somehow we still do. And there are mysteries in the Bible that are going to be hard to understand. But we have to make our calling and election sure. We have to make sure no one uh, loses their crown and so forth. And yet God knows. God also knows. God was there involved with you and me before we were conceived, before we were born, or even certainly as we were born. He watched you and me grow in our, in the, in our mother's womb. And he made you unique, one of a kind. Even your pupils are so unique that they now use pupils to verify ID even more effectively than fingerprints. He was there watching when you were born. He was there with you when you began to take your first steps. Our Father was watching you grow and develop from a baby. Our Father watched you during your teenage years. He felt your pain over the acne or pimples that seemed to pop out on your cheeks. I remember how I hated that. I used to get I used to get this pimple right on the edge of my nose and by my cheek and ah and then to get all pussy and I, I was I was trying to impress the girls, you know, and you think you're Oh, it was awful. He smiled when you made right choices. He shook his head slowly when you made dumb ones. But he was there, and he is there now with you. He promises he'll never leave you nor forsake you. This is God, my father, I'm talking about, a real father, a God who wants his children to wake up to him before the times get any tougher. And we're not in the tough times yet. So the way I read it, God gives us free choice but knows us so well, he's not going to be caught off guard. God is so smart that he works out even our sinful mistakes. Be turning now to Genesis 50. Genesis 50. Even the horrible tragedies so that in the end they work out for good. Remember Joseph and all the bad stuff he had to go through? Was God in that when his brothers sold him into slavery? When Potiphar's wife accused him wrongly? When he had to spend those years in that rat-infested prison for his obedience to God? Where was God in all of that? I'll tell you where God was. Like I said earlier, in our tough times is when we grow the most. Joseph had a lot of growing and toughening up to go through. And God used it all for good. We don't like the tough times. We don't like the chisel on the stone that's going to be in the spiritual temple. We're in the quarry now. It's kind of rough. And that's what Genesis 50 kind of says here when Joseph says this to his brothers who are afraid now that Jacob's dead, that, that Joseph's going to really get them. <coughs> Notice what Joseph says here in Genesis 50 verses 19 to 21. Do not be afraid, for I, am I in the place of God? But as for me, you meant evil for me, but God meant it for good. Let that sink in, brethren. You brothers of mine meant evil. Yeah, you intended to hurt me, and you did, guys. But you know what? God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day. I hope you're reading it with your own eyes. To save many people alive. Joseph is saying God was involved in all of this you did to me to save many people alive. God is involved in your aches and pains, in your troubles. You are the Israel of God today. This verse is not just about Joseph. This verse is about you, brethren. God meant all the evil you've been through for good in the end and the evil done to you to save many people alive. Remember that. We're going to come to that at the end of the message today. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Oh, that we'd learn this. God is so involved in our lives, even all the bad stuff. And I wouldn't say he made it happen, but he, in some cases he did. He certainly knew it would. I mean, even in Job, at the end of Job 42, verse 11, turn there and read it. Even in that story, you know, Job, Job 42, 11, it says uh, Job's brothers came and consoled him and com comforted him for all the adversity. Job 42, 11, turn over there quick and read it, that the Lord had brought upon him. The adversity, who? I thought Satan brought all that on Job. 
that the Lord had brought upon him. Isn't that phenomenal? I want you to think about that. God was involved in my life and my wife's life when he let our son die. Even in the evil things that happen to his people, God has a, an awful way, wonderful way, of turning that junk that surrounds our life into good somehow. Romans 8.28, you know that. So God is more involved in every aspect of our lives than we might realize. Yes, he's, we still have to work hard to obey. We still have to strive to make our calling and election sure, as Peter says in Second Peter 1.10. But somehow God still declares the end from the beginning. And Paul admits at the end of Romans 9 that this brings up a lot of questions. I covered this last time, but basically says we can't question the potter when he makes some vessels for honor and some others for dishonor. Remember I talked about that last time. Now, you don't need to agree with me on that last point, but I wanted to spend some time on that. So point number one is that God calls the weak of the world to confound the wise and bring himself some glory. And, of course, within that point, he, he, God the Father himself selects us, and he, and he worked with us and, and probably planned us from way, 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 way past longer than we think. Probably from the, I think, from the beginning of creation. Uh, certainly, from the, certainly from the time you were born, um, I think from way before then. Now, point number two from last time is you were created for a specific mission, a specific role, an exact spot in the temple of God's a spiritual temple coming and we're living stones in that ongoing project and right now we are in the quarry a dirty noisy painful place called the world and we're being shaped and chiseled to become the finished product right now no one would guess how perfect that finished product will be when they take a look at us now certainly when they look at me now When we put on Christ and his righteousness, and when the temple comes together, each of those individual stones is going to be spotless. What happened to you all your life will be used by God in the end to shape and mold you into exactly what he wants and needs. But you were made for specific assignment. I covered last time how any builder knows exactly what parts he needs, especially in a master building like the temple. Remember Solomon's temple? They even hired Hiram up, up there in, in Tyre and, and uh, uh, the Phoenicians and so forth, and, and the, the very, very specialized artisans. Okay, a builder not only knows how many blocks of marble, he wants to know where the marble comes from and what each block must look like be long before the buildings even started. Would God do anything differently? You're the blocks. So even the ones working on individual blocks may not realize exactly where the stone was going, and, what it, and, and it wasn't clear what it would do until it all beautifully and silently came together in Solomon's temple. We talked about that last time. Yes, you have a purpose. You are unique and not by accident. So please understand that, that you are unique. The fact is God wants you, planned for you, loves you, and chose you. Jesus, you know, was so aware of his mission. He lived a life with mission. At age 12, he says, I must be about my father's business. And then his last words to his dear father, it is finished. A bestseller is a book titled, A Purpose Driven Life. The title is true. Our lives should be driven by God's purpose for us. For example, if you're a husband or wife, Part of our purpose is to demonstrate God's love in our marriage. If you're a father or mother, part of your purpose is to help kids grow up to love God a little more easily by experiencing a father and a mother who are demonstrating God's love. We can go on and on. You have a purpose. Here's a lady from Texas who wrote to me about this topic. She says, Hi, Philip. I believe that God calls me to be his child and a member of his family because he loves me, plain and simple. And when you think about what an awesome thing it is to be loved totally and fully by the Almighty Creator God, well, your heart swells. Does he have specific and unique chores and tasks for me to do for him? Probably, if I have a willing heart and an observant and open to those opportunities. The Bible is packed, she continues. The Bible is packed, I'm still reading her, her note, full of examples of people who just lived and others who lived with purpose and design. Not always what they would have chosen, amen to that, but important and special to God and because they had a willingness to do and be whatever he needed. 
they have fulfilled that purpose. This woman said a ton in that message. Even if you don't yet know your purpose, live with a sense that there is a purpose and ask God to reveal it to you. So point number two, you were called because God, I feel, has a unique purpose for you and that he's preparing for you. You have a specific spot in the temple. Point number three from last time, God may have chosen you because he was working with you and your family. Uh, he, may have even, he may have even had bigger plans for your descendants than he had for you. We need to think much bigger, even generationally. Remember that from last time? And there are people being blessed today because of Abraham, because of Phineas, and so on. The uh, tape is turning over here. <clears throat> so, don't forget, again, the lesson of Joseph. He said that a lot of people went through what they went through to get so he could save a lot of people alive. Turn now to Philippians 1, verses 12 to 14. Philippians 1, verses 12 to 14. Paul saw the bigger picture. And you know what? If we can get the sense of the bigger picture when we're going through the hard times, instead of feeling abandoned by God, feel like God is giving us uh, the hard time to make us grow. You know, no pain, no gain. And so Paul, was, as he was beaten and imprisoned and treated badly, he could see God's hand at work in this. It's a real lesson for all of us. I don't, think it, I don't think we're very good at that in our soft Western world especially. Those of you who aren't in the Western world hearing this maybe are better off in those areas than we are. Philippians 1 verses 12 to 14. Philippians 1 verses 12 to 14. I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel so that it's become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. So he says, what's happened to me has turned out for good. And then he says, and most of the brethren in the Lord have become confident as they see me in my chains and are much more bold themselves to speak the word without fear. Isn't that amazing? Here's Paul being beaten in chains in prison. And he says, that's okay because this has, been given, this has given inspiration to so many others. I think that's such an awesome, inspiring point. <coughs> oh, that we would learn it. Oh, that we would learn it. This next point is new. We didn't discuss it. Let's move on now and, and build on the last, from the last point. Point number four, God chose you because he may want you to be the instrument through which he calls many others. He may want you to be, inst be the very instrument through which he may call many others if we'll let him. We're the instrument. Are we going to let the master play on this instrument? Or are we going to refuse to perform? That main witness we can give is by our example of a changed life, by the way. Another dear friend wrote me from the West Coast to say God has used her to bring her husband to be into the knowledge of the truth. They eventually married and to bring him out of the darkness of the way of life he was in before that time. What a wonderful thing to know that God used you to call someone else and even married them that person. I know it's happening. Several of you listening to this right now know that you are a member of God's church and are, or maybe even listening to this because someone else, a spouse, a friend, a neighbor, a work associate, spoke up and said something and came out of the Christian closet openly declaring their belief and faith in God and Jesus Christ and the doctrines that they represent and now you're here. Praise God for people willing to get out of the Christian closet. How many more could be hearing about God and His way if we'd all come out of the closets figuratively speaking? We sometimes, some of us have been so indoctrinated not to cram religion down someone's throat that we've gone to the other ditch. Turn to me, uh, to, with me to 1 Peter 2, verse 9. 1 Peter 2, verse 9. You and I have been trained and conditioned by some churches and ministers and religion to believe that God works solely through trained people, ministers mostly. Ministers, brethren, do a ton of wonderful things, and there are wonderful, faithful ministers out there, and God bless them. I don't mean to take away one iota away from them. I'm certainly not bad-mouthing them at all. I'm just adding that God wants to use all the parts of his body, not just the mouth. 
You can read that in 1 Corinthians 12 about the parts of the body. If all the body were an eye, where would be the hearing? The hand's no more important than the foot, he says. Hey, we need all of you working together. All parts are needed to make a body function properly. You and I are the parts. And you and I are important parts of the body. If I'm the armpit, I'm going to make that armpit be the best armpit possible with God's power and God's Spirit. If I can walk by the Spirit, I want to be the best armpit there can be. Many of you think I am the armpit. That's okay. I'll be a good armpit. You've been chosen to do more than just pay and pray. In 1 Peter 2.9, I ask you to turn there. It says you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. For what, brethren? That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That you may proclaim the praises. How, how are we doing on this? When was the last time we did that? That you may proclaim the praises of him who called. That wasn't said just to apostles. To the twelve disciples. This was Peter saying it to the church. Turn now to Acts 8. Acts 8. Please turn there quickly. Acts 8 verses 3 to 4. When persecution broke out strongly against the early church and the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. But the brethren were scattered. Guess what happened? <clears throat> In Acts 8, verses 3 and 4, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Okay, the apostles stayed in Jerusalem, but now look what happens in verse 4 of Acts 8. Acts 8, verse 4, therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Those who were scattered, the brethren, went everywhere preaching the word. You think preaching is just for ordained people? They help plant a few seeds of God's word that sure made it a lot easier for Paul and others to follow later, brethren. They sure did. Oh, they did, brethren. We limit God. We impose restrictions on what we believe God could possibly do with us. We're like the ancient Israel who limited the Holy One of Israel, it says in Psalms. You know, God... God needs people, servant leaders who understand what ordinary, you know, God, God, God needs you, brethren, to do the things he, he's called you to do. And, 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 and he, God needs you not just preaching it, but God needs your life to be a testimonial. You know, if, uh, if there's a new product out there that's supposed to give you energy or supposed to uh, get rid of acne or whatever, the best, test, the best way to sell it is to say, hey, look, you know what I looked like before, and now look after I've been using this product, now look at my skin. <clears throat> you see what I'm saying? And if they see obvious improvements, other people will buy the product. So if people see obvious improvements in your life. I think last time I talked about these these uh, sisters who came into the church. And uh, third sister says, whatever you did for these two girls, uh, my sisters, uh, please do for me also. And I said, I didn't do anything. God's power did that. These ladies are walking in the spirit. These ladies are letting God transform them. Now, if you want to be transformed by God, you're welcome to attend the church, but it's not going to be me that's doing it. Jesus taught us that we could do, we would do even greater works than he did if we would only believe. That's John 14, verse 12. But we're not seeing that, are we? So something's going wrong. John 14, 12, that if you would only believe, you will do greater works than I've done, he says. So start letting your light shine that men may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Start being more open about your faith and your belief. You don't think you can say much? You think God speaks only through ordinary, I mean through ordained men? They're poly speakers, maybe you're not. But don't forget, he even spoke through an ass, Balaam's ass or donkey. That's in Numbers 22. So there is a precedent. God doesn't have to use trained polished ministers if God has spoken even through an ass before, I guess he can speak through me and through you if we let him. That's why I share my website. Some have said it's helping them, so why not? We've been called to proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. That wasn't said just to ordained ministers. The command to spread the good news to all the world was to all the disciples, not just the twelve. The greatest sermon you and I can preach then is a sermon of a changed life. And that sermon of a changed life 
a life powered by God's Spirit, a life so different that in the book of Titus, Paul talks about it adorning the way of God. Again, all the scriptures are in the transcript. Adorning the way of God. You can make God's way attractive. Titus 2, verses 9 and 10. Titus 2, verses 9 and 10. I'm not turning there. Though they may think you have strange beliefs, they can't say anything bad about you and me, and I've come a long way on that. But with God's help and grace in the end, I'll be there. And you will too, if we do it by God's Spirit. You may live in Sin City. Uh, there are many Sin Cities. I got a, a note from somebody else who said she's in a Sin City of homosexuality. Still, let your light so shine that people may see your good works. And, uh, you know, and glorify God, not in your self-righteousness, but in your own powerful, uh, effective life that you can have. I want to ask you a question. If it were a sin, I'm sorry, a crime, if it were a serious crime to be zealous and loving, to be a godly Christian, if it were a crime to be one of God's people, would there be enough evidence to have you arrested and convicted? If it were a crime to be one of God's people, would there be enough evidence to have you arrested and convicted? In the days of Paul and Peter, many were arrested and killed because they were known as Christians. Are you known by your neighbors as a Christian, the good kind? If it were like in the days of Peter and Paul, would you and I get arrested? Because everybody everywhere would know that we are God's people? Turn now to Romans 1. I want you to think about that. I want you to think about that. Romans 1, verse 8. Let our faith become well known. Let people everywhere start to speak of our example. This is a noble goal. And if you're like me, we've some repenting to do for our lack of zeal, but we can start now if we failed in preaching this kind of sermon. Look what it says in Romans 1.8, the sermon of our lives, I'm saying. First, I thank my God, Romans 1.8. I want you to read it. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you that your faith is spoken throughout the whole world. <clears throat> your faith is spoken about Everywhere I go, Paul says. And he says something similar to the Thessalonians, I think even to the Colossians. But in 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 6 to 8, he says something similar. 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 6 to 8. Here's some homework for you. How are you limiting God? How are you keeping God from using you the way he could and would? If you and I would only believe. What miracles are not happening because of our unbelief or because of our sins? What wonderful marriages could we all be enjoying now if we just let ourselves get out of the way and let Christ live in us and start doing what Christ says a wife should do and start doing what a man should do? What powerful witnesses of what the Spirit can do in us mere mortals would be happening? If we'd let the light of God shine in our lives as a light for our neighbors, not a spotlight, but a light in the darkness. Brethren, God can change us. I know he's changing me. I know he's changing my wife. Long way to go. I started from way back. I shouldn't be married now, brethren. I've been a horrible husband much of my life. But this week coming up, my wife and I are celebrating. We have great plans for our 30th anniversary. God gets all the glory. I sure don't. I'll let my wife have a lot of that glory too. A lot of the credit. But we have to let God work in us. So point number four. Point number four is that God may, be, may have called you to call other people into his truth. And by our light and by our examples and by coming out of the Christian closet, we can do that. Point number five, God called you and allowed you to be through, uh, to, uh, what, allowed what you've been through so that you can relate to people with similar experiences and problems. And share the encouragement you've received from God while in your troubles. 
say that again, point number five. God called you and allowed everything you've been through so you can relate to other people who've had similar experiences and share the encouragement you've received from God while in your troubles. So you've been called because you can relate and encourage others. You've been called because you can relate and encourage others. That's point number five. This is why you've gone through what you've gone through all your life. This is why there have been people from all backgrounds called, some royals, some nobles, some fishermen, farmers, housewives, career women, and so on. This is one reason why you have been called. But back to the point. Yes, your background could come in very handy for God now or in the future. The very things you may feel are curses in your life could be the very things God is going to turn around for a blessing to various ones someday. Maybe not even in this life. Think way, way past today. Something in your experiences, your quirks, your personality, your character is going to be used to help a lot of people in the coming kingdom. God isn't done with you yet, and let's get excited about this. He needs people, servant leaders, who understand what ordinary people go through. If you're around a lot of people who are sinners, you'll be better able to relate, to understand whether they're adulterers or homosexuals or liars. As God calls them to a relationship with him, they will have to repent first, of course, but you will understand. We are called to be priests and kings. Our high priest had to become flesh so, we, so, that, he, so that he would understand the limitations of flesh. He was the one who said the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You know in Job 10, verse 4, when Job was going through all his troubles, and he's so frustrated with God, he felt so much like a bullseye was put on his life, and he felt unjustly so. Job asked God in Job 10, verse 4, you can read it yourself if you want, do you, he says to God, do you have eyes of flesh? Do you, God, can you see as a man sees? He's asking in the way we would say it, God, can you understand? Can you possibly understand what I'm going through? Now turn to Hebrews 4. Well, as you turn to Hebrews 4, for 33 years, God did see through the eyes of flesh. God did understand what it was like to be human. For 33 years, God made flesh, God who became flesh, did feel fatigue and persecution, rejection, being called a bastard, a glutton, a wino, even a sinner. He was called those things. He felt pain in the extreme with the scourging and the crucifixion. I'm sure the little towns he grew up in were not very kind to a boy of questionable parentage. Questionable parentage. And yes, for 33 years, God in the flesh knew what it was like to be human, for he was human. And now we can read Hebrews 4, because the principle we're about to read applies to all of us as future priests under our great high priest. Hebrews 4, verses 14 to 16, Seeing then that we have a great high priest, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted or tested as we are, and yet without sin. Therefore, let's come boldly to the throne of grace. He's saying, look, we can come boldly because he understands. He can sympathize with our weaknesses. He was tempted and tested in all areas as we are. He understands that so well. And then in chapter 5, he goes on to say, Keep reading there in verse 1 and 2 in chapter 5 of Hebrews. Every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, uh, that he may offer gifts and sacrifices. Verse 2, here it is, Hebrews 5, 2. He can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also subject to weakness. <clears throat> we know what it's like to have no money. We know what it feels like to have lost a child. I know what it's like to have been fired from a job, to be without work. I know what it's like to feel rejected by so many, to come from divorced parents. I know what it feels like to feel abandoned by your own father. 
I've come to understand that better lately, though. And I could go on and on, and so can you, about your life story. And I know what it's like to have committed what some call major sin. And so do some of you. Turn now to 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 to 11. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 to 11. We're in good company, brethren. Don't ever suppose that there aren't all kinds of horrible people, horrible past people, who people have who have horrible past is what I'm trying to say. Praise be to God that he can take such misfits and turn them into a holy spiritual temple. Your, your sinful past will be used to be one who understands and can help encourage others who once were like you. Once were. Who are people who are like what you once were. 1 Corinthians 6 verses 9 to 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived, he says. 1 Corinthians 6 9 to 11. Now he lists what some would call major sins. Neither fornicators. Hey, we all have done major sins. I certainly have done a bunch of these here. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. God be praised. He goes on to say, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. Remember Jesus said in Mark 2.17, I haven't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He says those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Sick people need a doctor, he says in Mark 2.17. I didn't come to call the righteous, he continues. I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Paul, you don't get the idea that Paul thought of himself as being a better sinner somehow. 1 Timothy 1.15, Paul says, Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm chief. Chief sinner. <clears throat> the church should be a place where spiritually sick should feel welcomed and can get well. And you've been called to be saved and to encourage others from that same standpoint. Start thanking God that he's not going to waste any of your experiences, but he's going to use them to bring people to Christ and into relationship with Father in heaven. You can tell people even now that in spite of your sins, many as they are and horrible as they are, Jesus died for you and saved you and now uses you and is going to have you be one of the parts of his temple. Show how Jesus does not hold your sins against you nor theirs against them if they repent. And you know what? It's often the case that people who committed the bigger sins, what others consider bigger sins, major sins, those people, according to Jesus Christ, in Luke 7:47, according to Jesus Christ, can end up loving God more. They end up more zealous for God. Jesus said that. He who is forgiven much, loves much. To whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Luke 7:47. I think that's why I have such a passion for God now. I feel I have a lot of catching up to do, brethren. A lot of making up to do to God. I feel I owe Him so much. I owe my God so much. I feel like Paul, chief sinner. But because of that, I love Him. I said at the beginning of this point seven, I mean this point, not point seven, point five, that you are not called just to relate with others, but also to share encouragement. Go now to Second Corinthians one. Second Corinthians one verses three and four. Second Corinthians one verses three and four. Please read this with me. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. That we're able to comfort others with the comfort that we received from God. When our son David died, I couldn't believe how dark a time that was, and yet my wife and I felt incredible peace, and we felt God's help and presence as thousands around the world were praying for us. The gravedigger said the same thing. 
And if any of you hearing this were there praying for us in 1982, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We felt it. And who's going to help someone who's had a horribly failed marriage, a failed family life, unless you've been through it yourself? Who's going to help someone racked with guilt and feeling suicidal unless you've been there? Those are the kinds of people I and you can help. This is a huge reason why we go through the hellish things we go through from time to time. This is why your son died, why your house burned, why you were burned badly. This is why you lost your job. This is why you suffer racial prejudice. This is why you've lost your family due to your beliefs. This is why you have cancer, arthritis, aches and pains and setbacks and problems. So you can relate and encourage people with the encouragement you've received. Maybe you weren't called to be a preacher. Maybe you're called in, that you can be a listener and a shoulder to cry on and bring comfort to people. Maybe you really, really have goofed up in your life. And I mean you have really goofed up. And God is still stuck by you. He's got your back. So now you can bring hope to people that God never gives up on us. No matter what. Because... And they can see that through people like you and me. Point number six, you've been called to be part of a team, a family, a group. You've been called to be part of the kingdom of God. Point number six, simply, brethren, is we are not called to be loner Christians. We have to mingle with people in the world and in the church. I won't take this point very deeply right now because of time, but I want you to think about it. Two are better than one. A threefold cord is not easily broken. A group of dedicated people working together will get a whole lot more done than one. We cannot be loner Christian. Christianity is not meant to be practiced in a vacuum. We've got to work with people. So get out, mingle, attend church, cross the family lines. One problem is too many denominations incorporated by man are claiming to be the one true church and are not showing any love to those who are not part of their system. So people get turned off and they just end up not going anywhere. Brethren, it's not right to be a loner Christian. Make sure you're involved in a group, in a group helping, praying, encouraging, physically helping, and so on. Be in touch with people and use and serve with other people. God called you to be part of a team. He's putting together a team. We've got to practice being a team right now. That's something I'm trying to work a little better on as well. Point number seven, the last point. One final reason, you may, be, you may have been chosen to be part of the elect, because God called and chose you to be among the elect, there will be a remnant of humanity saved alive. Remember what Joseph said? So point number seven, the last point, is you were called to help save humanity alive. Joseph said, and we are the Israel of God today, <clears throat> that God meant it for good to save many people alive. The end of Malachi 4 says that if we don't obey God and turn our hearts to the children and the, ch and the fathers to the children, <coughs> if we don't do that, God will strike the earth with a curse. Utter extinction, uh, utter extinction is one meaning of that word, curse. We all know the end of the story. And, Ma and Mark 13 says, Mark 13, verse 20, Unless the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh would be saved alive. But for the elect's sake, whom he chose, he shortened the days. The NIV says nobody would survive. The New Living Translation says the entire human race would be destroyed unless there were an elect. But for the elect's sake, whom he chose, God shortens the days. Brethren, apparently there will be enough worthy elect for God to save some of humanity alive. Your calling, especially your election of being chosen, is of utmost importance. You were called to help save alive your neighbors, your family, even total strangers on the other side of the planet. Don't fail them. Make your calling and election sure. We have a high calling. We've been called for specific reasons. These are just the beginning. You, you can think of many more, no doubt, now that I've, I hope, uh, primed the pump. So we've been called to confound the wise and noble, point one. Number two, you were chosen for a unique purpose that God knows, to fill a, spe a, a specific spot, a specific mission in the temple. Number three, you were chosen because God may have even bigger plans for some of your offspring even than you. Perhaps there's a bigger reason, like in Joseph's case, that we won't see till later. We've got to think bigger, much bigger, generationally. Point number four, you were chosen because God may want to use you to call others to himself. You were chosen, number five, because God wants you to witness for him through your changed life. 
the best sermon anyone can ever preach. That's all part of point number four, I mean. Then point number five, you were chosen because you can relate to people from what you've been through. And you're going through what you're going through so you can relate, so you can share the encouragement you've received. And you were chosen to be part of a team of people he's working with and you were chosen to help save humanity alive. For the elect's sake, the days are cut short. Brethren, share the word, spread the word. You have a mission and a purpose. Commit your life to God, and he will reveal it. This is Philip Shields saying, Till next time, God be with you, my dear friends and family. God love you, and he does. And share the word, spread the word. You have a purpose. God bless you all. <laughs>